Good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Raising a Bilingual Child, the Top 5 Myths. My name is Marie Jose Guerri, and I'm happy to be the moderator to, for this evening's webinar. Tonight's discussion is an important one, and we want to share tips with you, and towards the end of the webinar, we want to be able to answer your questions. We also want to share our bilingual, bilingualism, multilingualism, and doubt that you'll find in the end out menu of the GoToWebinar control panel. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pan and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your question into the question pan of the control panel. You may send in your question at any time during the presentation. We will collect this this and adjust them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Before we get started, we want to share with you a bit about what Morning Chappelle does. Morneau Chappelle is the world's large, largest provider of health, behavior, and productivity solution, helping over half a million people each year through therapy, education, and coaching. Children's Support Solution, Parcours d'Enfants, works with families, schools, and child care centers to identify children's needs and help them reach their potential. We work with infants to young adults of all abilities and believe that every child is unique and understanding that uniqueness is what we do best. We provide a wide range of services, including screening and assessment, one-to-one -one and group intervention, medical legal rehabilitation, and solutions for schools and daycares. We also have a special offer from Morneau Chappelle's Children's Support Solution, Parcours d'Enfants. Mention you participate in the Raising a Bilingual Child when you book an appointment with Children's so Support Solutions between now and December 31st, 2015, and we'll have the administration fee, uh, and we'll waive the administration fee. After the webinar, just visit our website at childrensupportsolution.com or call 1-866-653-2397. Children's Support Solutions, Parcours d'Enfants, is family-centered and interprofessional, meaning that we always start with the question, what will work for this child, and what is right for the family? We think about the mix of services that will help the child. In the Morneau Chappelle model, professionals are not just under one roof. They plan together, train together, and work together on a client file. It is an integrated approach to helping the family. Our therapists and educators are trained and certified in a wide range of disciplines, including clinical psychology, speech language pathology, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, behavior therapy, music therapy, special education, psychoeducation, guidance counseling, and tutoring. I would like to introduce Dr. Carolyn Erdogan speech language pathologist working with Children's Support Solutions, Parcours d'Enfants, and also works at Montreal Children's Hospital. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to begin by sharing a few facts with you. You may know that worldwide, there are now more bilingual and multilingual individuals than monolingual individuals. So in reality, in a sense, it's atypical to speak only one language, and the norm is to speak more than one language. Also, you may know that bilingualism and multilingualism is on the rise due to globalization. We travel now more than ever. We regularly interact with individuals from other countries in many of our workplaces. If you think only of the internet, for example, not so long ago, you would Google something and find primarily information in English. Nowadays, you'll find high-quality information in a multitude of languages. There are many ways to learn a language. You can learn one language at home, or a child can learn one language at daycare and at school. 
a child can learn one language with one parent and another language with another parent. We can learn two languages at the same time, what's called simultaneous bilingualism. Or we can learn one language after the other, what's called sequential bilingualism. Languages can also be learned successfully later on in childhood and even in adulthood. The fact that bilingualism is on the rise is great news because we have quite a few studies now demonstrating that bilingual individuals have certain cognitive advantages when compared to monolingual individuals. These cognitive advantages tend to fall into two main domains. The first domain is controlled selective attention, and the second domain is metalinguistic awareness. In the domain of controlled selective attention, we have studies showing that bilingual individuals are better at multitasking than monolingual individuals. So for example, we have one study that I thought was uh, quite interesting where bilingual individuals were um, told to participate in a driving simulation activity while having to also talk to a passenger in their simulated car. And what the researchers found was that when bilingual individuals did this, the quality of their driving was less negatively affected than when monolingual individuals had to simulate a driving experience and talk to a passenger in the car. So this was taken as evidence of enhanced multitasking abilities in bilingual individuals. Other studies have shown that bilingual individuals are better at problem solving. So we all remember those word problems in math where we had to concentrate on specific information and really ignore irrelevant information that was presented. And um, studies have shown that bilingual individuals appear to be better at doing this than monolingual individuals. Bilingual individuals are also better at metalinguistic awareness. Metalinguistic awareness is the ability to think about language and to think about the structures of language. And this ability is very important when we want to learn additional languages. Um, we even have evidence that bilingualism will afford us some important cognitive advantages all the way through old age. So for instance, um, a study has shown that in individuals who are predisposed to developing dementia, individuals who are bilingual will on average demonstrate the first signs or symptoms of dementia about four years later than monolingual. So another very interesting cognitive advantage. And it's thought that bilingual individuals have these cognitive advantages because they're constantly having to deal with two languages. They're, they're constantly trying to you know, talk or use one language and inhibit information in the other language. And it's this mental gymnastics that would um, allow us to profit and to have cognitive advantages. However, um, we know that this level of cognitive advantage is only present when the individual uses both languages on a regular basis and also when the individual has acquired a high level of proficiency in both of these languages. So speaking of high level of proficiency, there are certain basic requirements that uh, children um, must have in order to become highly proficient in two languages. The first thing is that they must receive language models who provide rich input in those languages. This is extremely important and um, it's relatively new information that the richness is extremely important, more important than we ever thought. So um, this is to say that parents should not limit themselves to just giving basic commands to their child or repeating routine instructions. They should really push the limits of language ability and have their child participate in higher level language skills. Like for example, asking your child to predict what's going to happen next in a story using language. Or asking your child to compare two different stories or two different characters in a story. This requires higher level language skills. The other requirement in order to become highly proficient in a language is that the individual have the opportunity to use the language in both formal and informal settings. So a formal setting would be something like um, a oral presentation in a classroom. And an informal setting would be, for instance, a child having a conversation with his peers in the schoolyard. 
we need to have experiences in both of those settings. The other condition that's required to attain a high level of bilingualism is to be in a language environment where each language is valued. So we know, for example, from studies in the United States that in some areas where a speaking Spanish as a second language is seen as a sign of lower socioeconomic status, these individuals don't develop their Spanish language skills as much as individuals who live in other areas of the U.S where speaking Spanish as a second language is seen as a status symbol and is seen as something positive. So an environment where the languages are valued is key. Children also need to have exposure to the languages that is regular and sustained. So unfortunately, a few weeks of summer camp each year is not sufficient to ensure a high level of bilingualism. Ideally, a child would have 50% exposure to one language and 50% exposure to the other. But that's not absolutely necessary. But what is necessary is a minimum of 30% exposure to a language in order to become productive in that language. So you actually have to sit down and calculate, OK, my child is awake this many hours in the week. How many of those hours does he spend hearing English versus Hungarian? And you need to get that 30%. We used to think that it was important to follow the one parent, one language rule. We now know that this is not necessary. It's a good way to make sure that your child is getting enough input in each language, but it's not necessary. I'd like now to address some common myths surrounding bilingualism. And despite the absence of evidence to support these myths, they are quite rampant in our society. The first one is that bilingualism will cause linguistic confusion. This is false. We're going to look at this in a moment together. The second is that mixing languages when talking to a child will result in confusion. False as well. The third is that children learn languages like sponges. We'll see in a minute that it's not quite as quick as we think. The fourth, that we should not expose a child who has language delays or language disorder or a child with developmental delays or developmental disorder to a second language because this may aggravate his difficulties. This is not true, and I'll tell you why. And the last myth is that when teaching a child a language, it's important to always expose him to a language as early as possible. And you will see that there are some exceptions to this. So myth number one, we often take as a sign of linguistic confusion the case of code mixing or code switching. So if we hear a child using two languages within the same sentence or within the same conversation, we tend to panic and think, oh my goodness, he's confused. We better eliminate one of the languages or she's confused. Um, but we know that code switching or code mixing is not a sign of confusion. We know this from three distinct lines of evidence. The first one is that most often when children mix languages, they're doing so because they don't know the word in the language that they're using. So it's a strategy. They're saying, I don't know how to say this word in English. I'm going to say it to you in French, and I'm going to hope that you understand. So rather than not say anything at all, the child is using her linguistic resources to communicate with you. The second line of reasoning is that we know that children would, will code mix at a frequency that very closely resembles what's happening in their environment. So a child who has a mom or a dad who tends to code switch a lot will tend to code switch a lot as well. There is even a study that showed that you can manipulate the frequency of code mixing. So there was a study where an adult was told to speak to a child and to code mix it about 40% of the time. And when the adult did this, they saw that the child quickly adjusted and code mixed about 40% of the time. And then a couple of days later, the adult went back in and was instructed to code switch about 15% of the time, much lower. And the child adjusted and code switched at about 15% of the time. So children are really the mirror of their environment. So clearly they're not confused because they're mastering doing what is seen and heard around them. The third line of reasoning is that we know that 99% of the time when children code mix, they do so in a way that does not go against the grammatical constraints of each of their languages. So for example, 99% of the time, they will code mix in a way like the big maison. Because in English, I would say the big house. In French, I would say la grande maison. So in both languages, we have determiner, adjective, and noun. So we're not violating the grammatical rules of e either language. 
the child will very rarely, less than 1% of the time, will they say something like, my hose baton. Because in English, we would say, my pink baseball bat. And in French, we would say, mon baton rose. So the word order is inverted in English versus French. And therefore, if you say something like that, you're going against one of the rules, one, the rules of one of the languages. The second myth, does each person have to speak only one language to the child? Well, we used to think that this was necessary, but now we know that it's not necessary. As long as the child is hearing some individuals who are not switching the languages, the child will be able to distinguish languages clearly. And for people who regularly mix the two languages, it can be really difficult to stop doing so. So telling a parent to stop doing that can cause undue stress. The third myth, do children really learn languages like a sponge? Well, in reality, it's not that quick. We know that in order to attain conversational skills that are like those of native speakers, children need to be exposed to a language for at least three to four years on average. And when we're talking about higher level language skills, academic language skills, children need about five to seven years of exposure on average in order to function like native speakers. So not quite as quick as learning like a sponge. The fourth myth, this is my favorite, is that uh, we should not expose children with delays or disorders to a second language because this may aggravate their difficulties. We have evidence that um, exposure to two languages will not aggravate the difficulty in the case of children with autism spectrum disorders, children with language impairment, or children with trisomy 21 who generally have cognitive impairment. In all of these cases, when we compare the bilingual child to the monolingual child, the child functions similarly with respect to language comprehension, number of words produced, age of the first word productions, length, average length of utterance, there is no significant difference. The only difference between, say, a, a child with trisomy 21 who's exposed to two languages and a child who's exposed to one is that the bilingual child is exposed to two languages. So uh, th that child has an advantage. There are no disadvantages in terms of the severity level of the impairment or of the profile of the impairment. So they don't look different in terms of their strengths and weaknesses if they're bilingual. The fifth myth, when teaching a child a language, it's best to expose him to a language as, as soon as possible. This is generally the case, however, there are some exceptions. If the learning environment is suboptimal, then it's not a good idea. So if mom and dad master Urdu and they don't fully master English or French, it's best that they continue to speak Urdu to their child because studies have shown that children who acquire high levels of language development in their maternal or family language will do better academically in their second language than children who have families who've decided to switch languages to expose them to the language of schooling. And to go a step further, we have evidence that children who know how to read in their first language or family language will learn how to read faster in their second language. So families should be encouraged to continue to speak their home language because the main goal is to provide as rich of a language model as you can. Now, in case I haven't convinced you that bilingualism was a good thing, um, if you are still thinking of eliminating the language in the case of a bilingual child, please think about the following consequences that may occur. At home, you risk creating a situation where the child is linguistically excluded from certain family members. So in my bilingual family, for example, if we eliminated French, some individuals in my environment would no longer be able to communicate with my child and vice versa. The child could also feel like a failure. Why is everyone dumbing things down for me? Why is everyone speaking two languages except with me? You can also be creating a situation where the language models lack proficiency. So in my bilingual family, if we eliminate French, we're going to be creating a situation where some individuals are going to be speaking broken English with my children because they don't master the language. And also, we can affect the quality of personal exchanges. My own children at different times in their lives have told me sweetly, but still have told me that I'm not as nice when I speak French, because French is not my first language. So I don't have all the rhymey, cutesy, lovey terms that I have in English to ask them to get their room clean, for example. 
And it's cool if you have a child in a bilingual setting and you think or someone in the environment thinks that it would be a good idea to have that child go to a regular monolingual school as opposed to a, an immersion program, you can create a situation where you're delaying service delivery to that child because now the child's in the new linguistic school setting and the staff is not going to jump on him and provide intervention right away. They're going to say, wait, he just got here or she just got here. This is the first time that she receives instruction in this language. Let's wait and give her some time to adjust. So we might be delaying things. And lastly, we may be creating a situation where the child is feeling rejected. Having left her friends in the other school and now having to try and make new friends at this new school can be a challenge to the child. So in summary, Multilingualism is the norm. There are significant cognitive advantages linked to bilingualism. Certain basic conditions are necessary, however, to become bilingual. And finally, children with language impairment or developmental impairment can become bilingual, and bilingualism does not exacerbate their difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carolyn Erdas. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question panel in your attendee control panel. So now we'll, now we'll start reading the questions. Okay, the first, the first question is, what age do you recommend to start the children? I'm sorry, I, I think I'm being asked at what age should children be exposed to the language? Um, so the answer to that is that children should be exposed to the language as soon as possible, um, keeping in mind that the people who are providing the language models should be completely fluent in the language and very comfortable in that language. The next question is about an immersion program. What do we have here? So in this school, it's 50% French and 50% English. One day English, one day French. Um, they speak English and maybe 10% Tagalog at home. So this is someone's children who are in a French immersion program with some Tagalog at home. Do I think that the children can become bilingual? Um, so, as I said earlier, what's very important is the percentage of input. A child who does not receive at least 30% of input in a language orally, um, so I'm talking about oral language input now, um, will probably not be productive in that language. So the child will understand some instructions in the language, might be able to repeat some key phrases that uh, she's heard often in the language. but will probably have difficulty producing new sentences in that language. So you really have to look to try and boost the input of Tagalog so that you have more than 10% if you want your child to be productive in that language. And additional ways to obtain language input might be to find some uh, books on CD, to have the child participate in community activities that may be offered in Tagalog. Maybe there's um, um, a, a community center where um, there are children who come together who speak this language. Uh, this is what we would need to look for in terms of um, providing enough input for the child to learn Tagalog. I hope I've answered that question. Um, other questions? We're just scrolling through here to see if there are other Okay, we have another one here. 
My husband is the bilingual individual in the household. Due to his job, he's away from the house months at a time, leaving my daughter without a second language. She's still too young to go to school. Will this absence of a second language affect her learning? Um, well, it will only affect the learning to uh, the extent that the rate of learning might be slowed down if the child doesn't have continuous exposure to the language. Um, it shouldn't cause a problem or an atypical profile, however. So again, the idea would be if you can find a way to provide additional input in that language, in that second language that your husband uh, exposes your child to, that would be ideal. Um, but you should not be worried about your child developing problems because of this. Um, what will happen is that the rate of development will be lower, probably. I'm now asked if I've heard of Dino Lingo and what is my opinion of their learning system. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that program. If you write to us and tell me a little bit more about it, um, perhaps I can uh, help identify some strengths or weaknesses of the program. I'm now being asked, how does this relate to a deaf child with a hearing family? Um, well, I'm not as familiar with the research on uh, deaf individuals, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. I would like to receive more information about specifically what you would like to know. Is it a question of um, bilingual input? Is this a child who um, is also being taught the oral method? Or I'm not sure. I would need more information to answer that question. I'm sorry. I'm asked about when is the best time to expose a child to a third or a fourth language. We know that with languages, it's never too late to learn a language, but there seems to be this window of opportunity that is best before about six to eight years of age. If you acquire a language after that, you're less likely to lose the accent when speaking the language, and you're less likely to fully master the grammar of the language. But I repeat that it's never too late to learn a language. But if possible, try to expose the child to the, the language before the age of six to eight years if you can find a very proficient language model in that language. And I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Carolyn Erdos. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Raising a Bilingual Child, the Top Five Myths. If you have any other questions, uh, please uh, submit them. We will uh, we'll be able, um, the answers will be available on the website. Depending on the volume, it might take ten, seven to 10 days uh, to be on the website. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. And we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Children's Support Solutions, Parcours d'Enfants, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your evening.